Hi everyone, and welcome to our um, Diamond, Trend, Diamond Trends webinar, our, quarterly, uh, our series of quarterly webinars. It's actually been a bit longer than usual since our last um, session um, for various reasons, but um, it's good to be back. And thank you all for giving me your time in trying to understand what's become quite a complicated market, I'm sure you'll all, all agree. And, um, and we're gonna try and make some sense of it. Um, I think one thing that uh, one theme that I think is true, whether whether there's good trading or not, is that there is uncertainty in the market, and that's um, because because of a number of factors. There's uncertainty both from the supply side of side of things, as well as from the demand side of uh, of the market. And this is after a very strong year in 2021 and the momentum continued into 20 into the first quarter we, we've had a nice ride um, but it's been a bit of a roller coaster and um and there's the and um the market sentiment has changed or the market environment has changed very quickly obviously because of the of what's happening in in russia and ukraine and we we pray for peace and hope that the the conflict will end soon but it's having serious com um, consequences on the diamond out uh, on the global diamond market and so the uncertainty comes into play when we think about russian supply and the um and the the position that our rosa holds in the market um and uh, and bringing those those that those goods off the market the, there are a lot of questions that come with that you know will there be a shortage of goods is there a shortage already what type of goods are being affected by um by the Russian supply being off the market, um will the will the diamond market bifurcate between um between diamonds that are um, sanctioned and those that are not sanctioned, and uh, will certain goods then sell at a, at a premium to to say non-Russian goods, for example, oh, sorry non-Russian versus Russian goods, um, and then the the big question, of course, is how long will the supply ch challenge last, and what is how is the industry adjusting to it? And so that's on the supply side, um, but there's also a, a change in in sentiment um, globally when we look at the demand um, the demand picture. And um, there's the geopolitical question with the Russia-Ukraine war influencing um, global uncertainty um, in, in you know across uh, in a, across all spheres. Um, whether you're looking at you know the looking at inflation and how much it costs to fill your 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 tank at the at the gas station, um, all these things are are there is an uncertainty about um, about the ge geopolitical question that's affecting the the economics of our of our environment. And then, um, independent of the the war in Ukraine, there is some uncertainty around the uh, around the the, uh, the U.S. economy. Um, the inflation has been up for for some time now. It's in, it's bringing in higher interest rates to curb that inflation, and all this is sort of. Um, combining to to increase household household expenditure, um, and that should have an impact on their spending. What that what households are spending on, what individuals are are looking to buy, and what they can afford to buy. And then the third aspect is the the slowdown in China. That there is still um, there are still lockdowns in some major cities in China. And this is affecting um, consumer sentiment there. It's affecting ability of retailers to sell. And um, that's having a ripple effect on the, on the diamond and jewelry uh, market in, in general. And so what does that, all that mean for price? We know that if, uh, if supply comes down and demand goes up, it means that prices should come up as well. Um, and the opposite, if, uh, if um, supply if there's an excess supply like we've seen in the past and uh, demand and and lower demand then it should have a um it, it should have a a, 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 a a decreasing effect on prices but what about but here we have a situation at the moment um currently where we're seeing a reduction in supply and a softening of demand from the highs of 2021 and, and, and earlier this year. So what does that mean for, for polished prices, for diamond prices in general, and how is that playing out, um, if at all? 
Um, and that's a question if we've really seen the effect of the of these crises yet in the market. So we're going to so throughout this um, for the, the goals of our webinar today, and I'm going to speak for, for 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes I go a bit over, so I apologize for that um, if I do. But we want to understand the recent supply, demand, and pricing trends in the diamond markets. We're going to assess Russian diamond supply and the effect that it has on the global scene. And then we're going to um, spend a little time and, uh, seeing what scenarios could play out for the diamond market and, um, and hopefully give some, that should give some clarity as to um, what we can expect moving forward. Um, I will, uh, after I've spoken and presented, I will um, leave some time for questions. So if you have any questions, um, please put, put them in the Q&A, um, in the Q&A se section, and, um, but not the chat session. I'm not gonna uh, check the, the chat. Um, during the webinar, put in the Q&A and I'll check it there, but feel free to check, chat amongst yourselves. Um, this is a, uh, the idea is to have a, to build community and, and to, discuss, uh, to discuss ideas between us. Um, and I will be checking those afterwards. So let's get to it. Um, so the, um, looking at the last year and a, year and a half almost, almost at the midpoint of 2022, We've seen a nice increase throughout last year. We know we've discussed that story before that there was a strong recovery from the COVID downturn of 2020 and a, a steady recovery of um, in, in 2021. And that continued through to March of, um, of 2022. And during this period of, um, of late February, March, where we see that Polish prices um, peaked was... Um, uh, was that period of firstly the the um, there was the Russia crisis that uh, the, the the Ukraine war broke out on the twenty fourth of February, um, and uh, subsequently on the on um, the, the US put restrictions on on debt finance to to various Russian institutions, including El Rosa, and then around March eleven, which is where we're seeing this um, sort of peak over here. Um, the U.S. banned imports of Russian origin goods, but there was all sorts of um, nuance attached to, to that. But the sentiment was there, or the message was there, that Russian diamonds were being affected and, and were being targeted as a means to, um, to, to um, influence the, 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 Russian, um, the, the, the situation in Russia, Ukraine. Um, um, also around that time, and it was uh, I think March 16, that the, the, the Federal Reserve, the, the US Fed, raised interest rates for the first time since December 2018. And so again, that, that um, sent, sent some, some message, although it was well expected that the Fed was going to raise interest rates, but it was the first action that took place. And, and again, sort of sending that message um, on an economic level, that um, that the U.S. consumer um, is is facing a changing environment, that um, that things are more expensive, that inflation is having an effect, and that interest rates um, are ultimately going to going to going to rise, and so that that changed the 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 trajectory of diamond prices, and um, that we've seen this uptrend through um, the last year and a bit. Um, we've seen a change in, in direction to, um, to a more cautious um, direction since, the, since in the last three months. And that sort of continued, um, that continued through to at least to the beginning of May, mid-May. And we've seen a, a flatten out a bit um, in, uh, in, in the more recent, uh, in, in, the, in the latter half of, of May. But we'll, we'll get back to that point. Um, just looking at it by um, by quarter, um, as again this puts it a, a bit in the in in a, in a historical context that um, through 20, 2020, in fact, and twenty twenty one, we saw these increases per quarter of the RAPI one carat um, index, um, whereas we've seen a, a long period. There was a prolonged period of of a downtrend. Um, and then now in April, May, we've seen the market turn 
Um, obviously, June is part of that second quarter that's, uh, that we're still in the middle of, but so far in the second quarter, we um, are seeing this um, the the a negative number in the in the RAPI um, in the RAPI index, and again in the in an historical to put it in context, we've seen various recoveries from um, from crises. There was two thousand and eight where the market slumped, and then the the the, the pretty pretty steep recovery through to mid twenty eleven, and um, when the market peaked and that was really a, a China expansion story um, as among others, but mainly a China expansion story there. And then slowly a, a gradual and very long downturn that um, culminated in the COVID pandemic um, and, this, and the crisis we experienced there. And then this very nice recovery that we, that we had last year and, the, and, and it was a good time last year across the pipeline. Um, and now the question is if we see how long um, now we're on a, uh, as I said, the market has turned in terms of the, the RAPI index. Um, and again, this is the one carriers. And uh, the question then is, um, you know, are, are we, are we look in for a repeat of, of that 2011 gradual down and painful prolonged downturn? Um, I'm not sure if we'll see that, but, um, but it's a question how long this downturn will, will last. Um, so, so let's just... Um, backtrack a bit and, and put some um, again the the Russia crisis um, in context and and look at those uh, look at the um, at the timeline because we we do want to and we want to um, the question we are asking ourselves at the moment is if the this decline in prices or this turn in the market is a result of um, of the Russia crisis um, or not um, in terms of supply the supply dynamic. Um, supply demand dynamic, or if it's a matter of sentiment that there's a this this um, which would be more on the demand side that it's a combination of the U.S. economy, the uh, inflation so story bringing some caution to the market, the geopolitical um, sentiment in general from the from the Russia crisis, and then uh, and the the China and the China slowdown. So. Is the Russia supply issue having an effect on the market? Um, the truth is, if um, if there's less rough coming from Russia, it's about thirty percent of the market. Then it should be pushing prices higher. Um, so so that already sort of gives us an an answer. But what is happening on the supply side? And so we got to look. We got to think back um, to our timeline and. Just before, uh, the, when we consider that Russia invaded Ukraine on, on February 24th, that was in the middle of, a, of an Arosa contract sale. And so the, the, the sale was taking place in, during that week already, which means that, that um, Arosa customers, or, or people like to call them site holders, which is more of a De Beers term, um, it's their alliance members is the correct um, terminology. Um, were already had already paid for goods in February, and were um, were expecting to take delivery. I mean, because um, that those delivery systems hadn't yet affected their delivery. But um, but then the Russia the, the war took uh, took effect. March six, um, there were reports already then as questions were being asked that, um, you know, if El Rose was able to continue selling in March, it, um, El Rose also sells via these contract sales, monthly contract sales to, which is the, the majority of its goods, but it also has auctions and, um, and various other, other mechanisms, sales mechanisms. But um, around March 6, we reported that El Rose um, sales were continuing using non-dollar currencies. And um, that initial um, sanction was um, targeting the, the banking system as well, making it very difficult for, um, for uh, customers to pay for goods um, uh, to our rows. And then around, uh, then March 11, the US banned imports of Russian origin diamonds. Um, later in the month, uh, March 21st, was scheduled to be the, the, the March El Rosa sale, which was cancelled. And, um, and then April 7, the, 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 the latest round of, um, 
of sanctions took effect where El Rosa was, was um, designated as a sanctioned entity by um, the US OFAC office, um, the, the Office of uh, Foreign Assets Controls. Um, and so that really um, put the put the final sort of it's the highest level of sanctions that that um, can be uh, can be designated, and so subsequently the April sale was also um, was also um, cancelled, and uh, as far as we understand the um, these contract sales, which if you think of it in like a De Beers in a De Beers um, context, it would be the equivalent of a site where with De Beers everyone site holders meet and go to Gaborone and look at goods and it's, there's an event around it. Um, El Rosa's kind of modeled itself around the same, um, the same system, although perhaps with a bit less prestige and pomp and ceremony, but there are these sales events where people would travel to Moscow to look at goods and, and buy their allocated supply on a monthly basis. And, um, and so as far as we understand, the El Rosa members have been informed that until further notice, basically, that any contract sale is um, it has been um, has been cancelled. But um, we are reporting that, um, or, or sorry, then subsequently, um, that that would put us put the screws on El Rosa's liquidity. They need that they need to that they continue to produce as, as far as we understand, and so they need to keep the the wheels turning and so they do have that option to sell to Gochran, the the russian state um gem repo uh, repository as part of the finance ministry um but generally Gochran doesn't buy the full um the full production of el rosa it's really kind of um on a on an annual basis what to fill gaps or, or whatever whatever each each one needs we are hearing more recently now that there are um, there are rumors, and it's very difficult to to confirm these rumors. But um, that slowly the um, uh, manufacturers are finding ways to to buy to buy Russian goods from El Roche, so in whatever whatever way they can. Um, and there are all sorts of complications to that in terms of the sanctions and separating goods, um, Russian goods from non-Russian goods, which, which I, um, I'm sure they would assure this, their, um, their clients. Um, but there are some, note, some points to note from those, um, from those uh, particularly the sanctions, um, brought to the market a concept of substantial transformation. And this is something that we hadn't really discussed in the past, although it should have been on, on the industry agenda, because it's not the first time that a diamond entity has been placed on the US OFAC list, been sanctioned, um, and, the, and therefore that idea of origin of supply um, has been in the discussion. But the, the sanctions that, that um, the US puts on, on El Rosa um, were specifically for Russian origin goods. And so it left the question, what happens with uh, where um, a manufacturer buys rough, brings it to, their, to a different center, be it Antwerp, India, um, Israel, wherever it is, and polishes the goods in say India, and then the polished is no longer a Russian origin good. And so that's, so it didn't, so it allowed for um, substantial transformation and, um, and therefore, it was kind of a loophole. Um, but most retailers um, took, took the bull by the horns and enforced their own um, origin, origin standards where they would not buy polished um, that had originated from Russian rough, no matter where it was cut and polished. And so, um, so that's just an interesting side point. Um, it's, it's been a, it's been a discussed quite quite a lot that um, it's a loophole that people can go around. But I think it's coming from the retail sector, particularly the majors and the major brands that would um, would, would not want to take that uh, that that risk um, to to buy Russian goods. And um, they are enforcing their own standards. That kind of brings takes the substantial transformation off the table. And so we return to our question now about whether the impact of the Russian sanctions have been felt in the, in the polished market yet. And um, over the next few slides, I'm going to suggest that we aren't really seeing 
the impact on Polish supply yet of the of the from the Russian from the Russian sanctions, and that's it. And and so our first important call type, um, so to speak, is uh, is on Rapnet. We're still seeing record levels of record inventory on Rapnet, and. Um, uh, in terms of the number of stones that we, we are now seeing, it, it, the, the number of goods on Rapnet is uh, over 1.8 million. It's, uh, it could be also because we see we, we've had a growth in members, but, but still um, the, the overall volume of inventory on the market is, is pretty high. And um, if we're looking, this graph shows uh, dates back to the beginning of 2018, where there was 2018, the market, the market crisis was excess supply. And we kept on looking at the inventory on Rapnet and saying, look how high the inventory is historically. But we've surpassed that amount um, post-COVID that um, a lot of goods were taken off Rapnet during the COVID crisis, um, but it's steadily built up again. And now since mid-2021, we've been at pre-COVID levels and um, and certainly the and and the market is or at least Rapnet the number of goods on Rapnet is is pretty high at the moment. So there is inventory out there, um, and uh, and um, and that would again suggest that there's no the that the shortage that that uh, the the lack of Russian diamonds on the market should bring hasn't hasn't yet hit the polished market. Um, when we look at uh, Indian, the, our data out of out of India, and India is a, a, an excellent bellwether for for polished supply because it, it buys such a large proportion of uh, of global rough, and um, and so we've seen we see in the we actually see on, on the bar on the bars, um, that's the volume of uh, of polished that's come out of India in the first quarter. Um, historically, compared to last year, it was down. Um, but last year was a very strong year for polished exports from Russia. And also we've got to remember that there was still some, uh, well, in 2020, there was a, um, a reduction of, of polished inventory in the market. And then that slowly built up um, along with good sales overall in the, in the market. So. But it seems that in the towards the end of 2021, there was some buildup of um, of polish in the in the system, and that may still be be um, be lingering in the market, particularly on the less desirable polish that's out there. But in it, but in terms of exports and and the, the the volume of goods coming out of India, and um, the first quarter was relatively was let's say it was normalized. In fact. Um, but uh, except for 2020, it was lower than than it was a fairly low um, first quarter. Um, but in terms of pricing, which is the blue, which is the blue line, and that's uh, and that that really illustrates one of two two things really. Firstly, that prices have come up over the last year. That we've seen that we saw earlier that that price um, trend, that positive trend that went through. From the from the from the um, the middle of 2020 through to the first quarter of 2021, sorry 2022, um, that that would influence the value of exports to increase, and then also that there's been a general shift towards towards um, uh, higher quality and maybe larger goods, maybe certified goods versus the smaller melee goods in that time. And we'll get back to that point when we discuss melee, which is um, now um, starting to heat up. Um, on the flip side, when we look at the US imports, to um, uh, the imports of polished um, to the United States, which is again, kind of a bellwether for the polished market because it's the biggest and a very dominant player in, the, in, the, in terms of polished consumption and jewelry consumption, we've seen a, a bit of a spike in the first quarter, in terms of um, of polished intake, and it's about uh, for goods above half carat, and the goods below half carat, the data is a bit iffy on uh, uh, on the US um, from the US government. So um, it's a question you need to ask them. But 
um, on these higher value goods on the on the on on the um, about half carat, we've seen a a, a, um, an, a a strong quarter in the first in the first quarter, and that maybe that that uh, um, uh, that correlates to the the increase that we've seen the increases we've seen on RAPNET of the goods available to the market. So, um, so again, it, it, re, it reinforces um, what I said earlier that on the Polish side of things, we're not yet seeing the, a, a shortage of supply as a result of the Russian um, goods being off the market because in the first quarter, there was still this, um, this um, steady influx of goods to, to the United States. And, and I would still, even, even though it was a bit down, I would still argue out of um, coming out of India, and uh, and the and the midstream in general. So then, what is um, so if so so then what is influencing the the price decline? As as we've seen, I would I would say that that in the first quarter supply was fairly normal. It was uh, nothing out of the ordinary. But um, demand has softened in the in in the last um, few in the last two months at least. That um, for a number of reasons, and I'm, I'm I'm repeating myself, but firstly, there is a seasonal effect where April May, after a strong first quarter of trading, after a, a holiday season, um, retailers are replenishing inventory, and the pipeline in in general is replenishing, and and we saw a very strong level of business activity in the first quarter in general, from rough through to through to retail. Um, but that generally does slow in the second quarter. So April and May are generally uh, slower months for the for the for the trade. Um, that combined with the geopolitical turmoil, um, which which has influenced sentiment in the global market, and with that with that reduce with those reduced economic sentiment about global economic growth. Um, comes a lowering of trade expectations. So, because of the uncertainty that the that the Russia crisis has created globally, I think that has fed into a more cautious outlook for the diamond trade in general. That again, combined with the U.S. economic caution, high inflation, higher interest rates, lead to a squeeze on 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 household spending, and then. The China slowdown and due to the, the continued impact of COVID-19, where retailers are, are have been, uh, in, in some major cities um, have been unable to sell, and also the appetite to buy among consumers has been diminished to some extent. And so when we look at the um, US economic indicators, um, we see a changing story. And so the, 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 the blue line is probably the most um, most in, most important uh, it, it, um, narrative that we've seen coming out of the United States this year, and that is U.S. inflation. That um, since the beginning of last year, 2020, um, uh, the the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is up by um, by over 10 percent, and we are seeing we now you know we're seeing record inflation or, or inflation at 40 year highs, um, as as many of the the headlines are, are telling us. <clears throat> And, and we don't need the headlines to tell it. You just you just have to go to the you just got to have, got to go to the petrol pump or to to your you do your grocery shopping, and it's and it's quite evident. Um, the yellow line is the the S and P five hundred. It's been a bit of a, a tumultuous year so far on the stock market, and um, and that again expresses some economic uh, some caution about um, about the um, investor and and, and consumer. Um, confidence um, moving uh, about the current economic environment. And just as a way of comparison, um, that ultimately would have an effect on the on diamond pricing, the black line being the RAPI index for one carat as we've seen as, as we see this um, sort of this uh, volatile um, uh, environment take hold and inflation rise. It's had an impact on um, on market sentiment, at least, and and translating to um, to some caution about um, about pricing, about trading in general. <clears throat> and 
and it's not just within the wholesale markets. It's a it's a message we're kind of seeing um, anecdotally, I would say, from the from the from the from the big retailers that um, the retailers are still in a period where they are reporting positive positive numbers from for their reporting um, for their reporting uh, period. So that would be for 2021 through to, Mar uh, through to March of this year. Um, but they, we are hearing a change in, in sentiment amongst retailers. Um, for example, um, I think the, the, the most uh, relevant for the jewelry industry has been from Brilliant Earth, where they reduced the outlook for the for the um, for the for the for the coming year for the for the current full year, um, and uh, that affected their their stock prices. We've seen, and um, and that's after they had a, a they had decent results. Actually, it was it was a, they they're showing good good um, they're showing good uh, good good growth, um, but the the sentiment changed. And uh, as the CEO um, Beth Gerstein said, um, as the second quarter progresses, which we're in right now, we're seeing impact from uncertain global uh, geopolitical and macroeconomic environment reflected in moderating sales trends and in our updated outlook. We're getting a similar sense. We've got a similar sentiment from uh, from the Macy's CEO, also from um, from Richmond, that looking forward, looking forward, they're not as confident as they were say three months ago. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of China, we're not getting a lot of data out of China, but um, from Swiss watch exports, which is kind of a, also tells us a bit about the luxury market and the high end um, uh, high end jewelry market. Let's say um, it's that Chinese the, the slowdown in China that's um, that's uh, that's having an impact on on Swiss watch exports. Okay. Um, so where are we now? Um, so um, I keep repeating the question, are we seeing the impact on supply? Not yet, as we've seen, um, but, uh, but we are starting to see a declining supply. I'm sorry, and, uh, but, but what we are seeing is that, um, as I said, if, uh, if, there, um, if we're not seeing a, uh, a, an impact from supply, uh, the 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 sense of the slowdown is um, in demand is having a, a greater a greater impact, um, and the but the lack of Russia of Russian supply is not felt on the polished market, but we are starting to see signs in the rough market, obviously that um, there's less rough supply coming to the market, and so that should affect the polished market moving forward in some way, um, and so when we look at the rough uh, rough um, market. In the in the first quarter, which again, if you remember, if we, you think back, there were still El Rosa sales in February. Um, from March, uh, uh, the, the the market missed out on the rush on the on the on the El Rosa goods. So there was still some sales um, and imports from Russia into India, for example. Again, our little bellwether that. Um, that uh, there was a slight dip in uh, in the carrots coming into. Of, of rough coming into India in the first quarter, and um, the blue line again is that is the the value of the of the rough, which um, which uh, which is largely driven by driven by price increases compared to the, the the previous year. So if you compare to the first quarter of last year, twenty one, there's a drop, a significant drop in um, in rough imports in in terms of volume. But the, the value is still much higher, is, is much higher. And so already in the first quarter, and I would say probably because of the, the, the lack of sale in March um, of, uh, of El Rosa, that we are seeing, um, we are starting to see a, a decline in rough imports to, to, um, to the market. Um, this is on a monthly basis. Um, the, whereas before that's a quarterly, on a monthly basis, we see that definitely in April, that uh, that April was the for in terms of India's uh, of rough imports to India was the lowest month that we've seen um, at least uh, since the beginning of twenty one, but probably um, stemming a bit further than that. <clears throat> 
And um, and so the, the question is, what, what do the miners do about, or, or can the miners fill the gap? And, uh, and do they have the inventory to, 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 to supply more goods to the market if it needs it and clearly um, will be need, needing it? And so when we look um, back at last year, the miners sold off a lot of inventory. Their sales volume of the, and this is based on, on the, the, the major miners, um, De Beers, Alrosa, Petrodiamonds, um, Lucara, um, uh, who else? Uh, Gem Diamonds and uh, Mountain Province as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, the, the, their combined um, carrots that they sold to the market exceeded their production. So, that, um, and they had built up a fair bit of um, inventory because of over COVID. And um, they uh, in 2019 as well. If the if the blue line is pointing up, it means that production exceeded sales if it's pointing down as it is did in 2021 it means that sales exceeded production and they reduced their inventory and so the market absorbed a lot of rough in 2021 and um, in in the first quarter of 2022 there was a slight um uh, there was slightly more production than, um, than sales in 2022 in in that first quarter but not by much um but that 2021 number it really tells us the story that they don't have that they don't have that that a lot of that inventory that would maybe cushion the uh, the supply to the market without um uh, without having Alrosa in. And the question, of course, is how much um how important is Alrosa? And and this graph tells you that Alrosa and in 2021 accounted for about for almost a third of um, global supply by our estimates in terms of the, the carrots coming out of the ground. And um, between Alrosa and the beers, they are the major producers of rough diamonds to the market. And so the diamond industry relies on Alrosa and the beers in a very very strong way. <clears throat> and so with so, so without um, without the, the the Russian goods on the market, we are seeing um, and and we we started to see this uptrend in uh, in rough auction prices um, already, particularly in the second half of two thousand and twenty one. But we are seeing now, um, if you look in 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 April, in this final um, in in this final little uptrend here. That, that auction prices are, are starting to rise again. We've had this, we've had a strong increase in the secondary market and, and the auction circuit of rough um, of rough prices. And that's that's something that um that where in the rough market you have primary supply, which would be from mainly from you know to be from directly from the miners, um, that and particularly De Beers and El Rosa. And then you've got the auction circuit where people are, are bidding for goods. Um, whereas the beers and Alrosa, they, they're setting a price and selling the, via a contract. Um, here, the market is bidding for goods, and we, we're seeing that the that uh, the difference in price between um, between those the beers boxes and the the equivalent goods that, that are sold on auction, there is a, a, a rising premium, um, and the the auction prices have come up um, quite strongly. Um, uh, and, and that's again, it's, a, it's an indication of, um, of non-Russian goods that, are, that are, 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 are rising in demand. Um, and that's particularly on the smaller goods. The, the gray line and the blue line are, um, are, are for smaller goods below, below, um, below uh, to around half carat and lower below 60 pointers and points um, resulting polished, let's say. Um, whereas um, <clears throat> the yellow line are on is is a, is more a reflection of uh, more of a larger size, um, around 75 pointers to uh, to an, a carat and a half um, in terms of the the rough. Um, but it's not a, it's not sort of a parcel um, a resulting parcel for a polished, which is where, where the arose of goods are strong. Anyway, it's besides the point. Um, and so, and so we, when we look at the rough market, we 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 
we consider three scenarios that could play out. The first being that um, there's a there's a potential um, there, there's a potential polish shortages that will come to the market because there is a lower rough supply coming through as as we saw out of um, ex, uh, exports from India. Uh, sorry, imports of rough to India came down in April and, and was even a bit down throughout the first quarter. So there's less rough that come to the market. And so we would expect that that should translate to shortages in the Polish market at some point, perhaps in, in um, June, July, maybe June's a bit early, but we're already in June, um, but July, August and onward. Um, the second scenario, is that manufacturers would find a way to buy Russian RAF to supply markets where they are legal to, cons to the consumer and particularly um, in, in Asia. So, um, so China, for example, um, might, might be a willing um, buyer of polish that is, polish that is cut from, from Russian RAF. And if that is the case then, and we are already hearing these rumors and, and um, it's a, a sort of sort of a, a well-known secret almost becoming. I don't know if it's a rumor anymore that manufacturers are buying rough um, or finding ways to buy rough from from Russia. We're not sure what sort of volumes they are, but then they would would need to keep those goods separate from their non-Russian goods um, in their manufacturing uh, in their in their factories and and would need to provide the assurances to their customers in the United States that those are not Russian sourced goods. Um, the third scenario um, is, and, and it's not really an option, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, as well as, that the US market would be operating at a reasonable level and faces um, scarcities due to the absence of Russian goods in that market. So until now, um, the, as, as we're starting to feel the, the reduction of supply from the Russian story on the rough side, the sentiment, let's say, has been cushioned by the fact that demand has softened. Um, but if the US market is, is operating at a, at a reasonable level, and I think it is op operating at a, at a reasonable level, we'll, we'll certainly have better answers on that front um, around in a, in a week or two's time when the when the Vegas shows take place, um, then the, the, the US market may fa face um, or the, and the market in general would face scarcities um, due to the absence of those Russian goods. So the, 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 the short the bottom line is that the, the longer the war goes on, um, and the, the 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 deeper the shortages would would be, and the and uh, and so we have to understand where those where those um, where El Rosa is strong in in its supply, and um, and that's where we are starting to see the shortages in the rough market in certain categories where El Rosa is is particularly strong. El Rosa goods El Rosa is very strong in the small goods in the melee where it's um, particularly the top quality melee, where it um, accounts for a, 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 an estimated 50% or more of the, of the global market, it's particularly strong in the higher colors, the DEF goods um, um, on those melee and also on the, the larger goods. Um, square or, or rectangular fancy shapes are, um, are there, there's, a, there's a good supply from El Rosa and, and El Rosa is well known for its fluorescence as well. Um, which will be an interesting segment to watch because the, the trade has this weird relationship with, with fluorescence and Oroso was putting a lot of marketing dollars behind um, changing the perception of fluorescence um, to because it had a high it has a high percentage of its production um, with with fluorescence so it's a question if the gap between no fluorescence faint um, strong blue will will decrease with the with um, fewer fluorescent goods on the market, or if it will continue to increase, um, I can't quite get my head around that one. Anyway, those are categories that that are worth looking at and keeping an eye on at the moment. And and I think we are starting to see in the at least in the rough market, the effect of the lower supply of those type of goods and um, having an effect on the on on the rough market. <clears throat> Um, the, 
the US, um, and, and that's and, and so th those are those are areas where Arosa is dominant. But it also it still accounts for a large percentage of other goods as well because of its dominant its general um, large production that it brings to the market. Remember, it's about a third of global supply, um, rough supply. So the, can the US um, can the US uh, find its typical American goods without the El Rosa, without the El Rosa production? So even if um, even if even the, even in areas where El Rosa is not the, the dominant um, player, and um, it's still a, an important supplier of goods like um, PK goods, which uh, which the American jeweler uh, relies on oversizes um, and the like. <clears throat> and so um, and so. Uh, when, when I showed you the inventory graph of uh, RATNET, we saw the, that rat inventory on RATNET is, is really at record levels at the moment. But that's looking at the market on a general level. It's all stones, all unique, unique diamonds um, counted on, on RATNET. But what if we divided or segmented into certain categories? And we are seeing a reduction in in polished inventory in certain categories of goods. And it's quite interesting to see the relationship between that inventory and the price of those goods. And so um, for our purposes, I'm sticking with the RAPI categories, which is D to H, color, IF to VS2, clarity goods. But when we, when we look at the 30 pointers, for example, from the beginning of 21, the orange line is the, the inventory, the volume of goods on RAPNET, and we saw this some um, steady increase until the beginning of, of um, so, uh, until the uh, around mid January, February, and so, and um, around Jan from January, February, this de decline in inventory was a period when the market was very strong. We saw very strong trading, and that that. Um, influenced inventory on RAPNET to come down because people were buying those goods. And, um, and, uh, and, and at the same time, prices were going up in the blue line over here, that, um, that as demand increased, price, it drove prices higher. Demand increased, supply decline, and prices rose. That's exactly how it should work, right? And so, um, and so the market was working well until around um, that February mark where, um, where prices um, peaked, interestingly enough, around, um, the, around March 6th, March, between March 6th and 11th. And that's when the sanctions really took hold, that the US banned, uh, the US banned um, in, uh, imports of Russian origin goods. And, um, and again, it kind of influenced that sentiment. But also there was that economic story of the US raising in interest rates, et cetera. And so that, that overall caution came into the market. And so as inventory flattened off on the, um, on the, uh, on, on the 30 pointers, also I would say because prices had come up so strongly that um, it may have scared off some buyers. Um, and so people weren't willing to replenish inventory that had been sold. Um, in terms of the manufacturing coming out of India, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but we have seen that inventory has flattened off. And now from April, um, we are seeing a, 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 a slight decline in inventory of these goods. Um, not a slight decline. From the beginning of April through, through, to the, through, through to today, we've seen a steady decline in inventory of these 30 pointers. And that is influencing... A, um, a stabilization at least of prices, in fact, a slight increase, uh, a slight upturn in the, in the, in the RACI index for these goods. Seeing a similar shape, a similar story in the 50 pointers, um, as you see uh, from, uh, from around December, January through, through to the beginning of March really, or, or through April, uh, sorry, through February, um, we saw inventory come down and that was the demand story, prices going up, because the, because um, as as buying and trading was strong, and it peaked around the same time, um, at the and prices came down, um, and and now we're seeing that inventory is coming down again, 
um, although it's kind of flattened off um, uh, in the in the last few weeks. And with that, the 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 decline in pricing has flattened off as well. Um, and the one carried is, um, again, it's a, it's a similar story, ri rising inventory through 21, a decline as, um, as sales improved and prices, uh, pushing prices up, and then prices peaked around, um, around that February, March period. And uh, now we're seeing a, a, a bit of correction, but um, it, the difference here is that inventory um, continues to rise um, to some to some point. Uh, continues to to sort of we have we haven't seen the dip in inventory on the one carat as like we saw on the thirty pointers and the half carat. Um, and and so it's interesting to see that relationship between the inventory and the and the prices. The um, the, the the one carat is seem to be trying to hold firm over there. Um, and so, and so with the, with these with the um, the decline in inventory, and and I would like to use the thirty pointers and the fifty point and the and the half carats as the example here, we would we would expect to be hearing about about shortages in the market, um, but we haven't really we, we hear about um, it being difficult to replace goods that that a that a dealer has bought or um, or, or, or that a dealer has sold rather. That they want to, they they they're looking for words as difficult to find, but we aren't hearing yet of these major shortages in the market. And although inventory, um, sorry, that's the one carrot. Although inventory has come down in the last um, in the last month or two, on the thirty pointers, for example, it's still fairly high in terms of. Um, in, in, in historical terms, if you look at a year ago, um, where we are today in, in, uh, at the beginning of June and where we were last year um, at the beginning of June, in fact, the inventory level is higher on these, on these categories than last year. And last year was a strong, um, last year being a strong market. And the same in the, in the half carriages that, um, that although inventory has come down in the last few months, there's, um, we're still higher than we were last year. And it's, it's talking very generally and, and I, I understand that, but uh, it's worth noting that I don't think we're in the stage yet in the polished market where we can talk about shortages, but the trend is there. The, the inventory is coming down, but um, when you compare it to put it in the context of, uh, of, of previous years, um, there is still a, a fair bit of inventory that we're seeing on, on Ratnet in these categories, at least. Um, in the one characters, um, certainly, they, um, the, 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 there's, there's quite a bit, um, quite, quite a big difference between where we are this year and last year. And again, there, there's so many, um, the, the, uh, sometimes we fall into the trap of generalizing in the in the in the diamond market each each diamond is different each category of di within each category there are categories and within each category of categories there are categories and so um uh so so i think we've got to be very careful to look at certain segments of the market and that's why it's, i think it's very important to keep in mind the type of rough that El Rosa brings to uh, is is responsible for in the market, or really has an influence in the market. So um, inventory is starting to decline in certain categories. Um, is this due to, uh, our favorite question? Is this due to the Russia Russia crisis? Um, on the Polish side, I I still think that um, that that it's not yet. We, we, because the if you think about that timeline that we spoke about earlier. There's still rough. The, the, the last time that rough came to the market from Russia in, a, in an open way was late February. Those goods are, are, are legally in the factories and being processed, and only now coming through the, the system as, um, as polished to the market. The, the sanctions would have applied to goods um, bought um, after March 11, I would say when the second round of sanctions really took hold where, where the US banned imports from, uh, from of Russian origin goods. And so 
we we only now th there is that lag that time lag between buying rough and polished coming to the market and so we haven't yet passed that time lag and so that's why i would say that um come uh, come july august maybe we would then start seeing start talking about um about uh, polished shortages so it could really be a, a matter of sentiment it's um the that um uh, that that, uh, that inventory is starting to decline that people are um are holding back perhaps they're holding that polished supply because they're expecting shortages to come uh, in in the in the near future and therefore would be able to um are speculating that they might that they might um uh, that, that that they might um be able, might get a better price in in two three months time for the goods that they have at the moment um they, they, there are all sorts of possibilities and um what i mentioned earlier it's not necessarily a question of shortages at the moment it's simply an inventory decline when we compare year to year um it's um uh it's uh it's still historically relatively um, in a good uh, in terms of inventory in a, in a strong position, I think it is worth noting the um, the melee market, and this this isn't me necessarily melee, but it is uh, it, you know um, parcel prices, goods that are not certified, sold as parcels, and the trend is the same I think in the melee market. But we had we had spoken about it in the last webinar as well, I think, where we saw the strong increase in pricing. Um, in the in the uh, third and fourth quarter of 21, um, and then and that continued um, uh, for a while for a bit in January, um, but we have seen a correction in these in the melee market in uh, in uh, in the last few months, and in the in May we we saw that um, stabilize, and now we we are I I I feel that we are starting to see an upturn again in the in the parcel prices in in melee, as um as the the Russian as the Russian um rough is becoming um scarce uh, is not on the market and um and perhaps there's a there's an expectation of of um of less melee supply um, but also because there is less melee supply. And when we when we think about back what I said about the of, about some um, polished exports that there was a shift towards higher quality higher um, priced goods um, in the first quarter, um, there that would indicate that there is a there was a shift away from lower priced goods being the melee. So I have a feeling that during this period there was um there, there was uh, the market sort of ebbs and flows in in normal circumstances on the on the melee side and um and manufacturers um shifted somewhat to uh to the um to the larger sizes so just some final uh, final thoughts and and questions that we we need to think about moving forward into the second half of this year that the, the, the one or two trends that I'm picking up on that uh, I think the, the market will bifurcate um, into segments, into Russian and non-Russian goods, at least in the short term, as, as long as the, um, uh, hopefully it's the short term, as long as the, the crisis there carries on. But, um, but ma manufacturers, um, I think manufacturers will continue to find ways to buy Russian goods for centers that are willing to buy them, being particularly in uh, in China and um, and then the question will be and, and something I'll be keeping a close eye on whether the Russian goods polished from from uh, from Russian origin rough will sell at a discount to non-Russian um, non-Russian goods in fact both on a rush on a rough and the and the Polish side of things um, I would imagine that if if uh, a company is willing to buy from El Rosa at this stage, they, there would be some discount to the market that they would that they would be buying it, and and so will that translate to the polished market? And I think it will, because already we're seeing that traceability and um, source of origin is becoming um, important, more important even. It's a big theme editorially that we're looking at this year. Um, and uh, and and since the the Russia crisis broke, 
we've seen announcements from all the service providers on the traceability front, including Tracer and the GRA. Um, uh, Everledger had something out um, today with uh, a collaboration they're doing with, um, with the, the Antwerp World Diamond Council uh, Center. Sarin, I trace it as a new um, traceability program out of Belgium. And so it's not a coincidence that, that we're seeing these announcements um, and uh, of these companies that are, are um, highlighting the service that they provide. And by all means, we are hearing from them that, that it's not only a mark, it's not a marketing ploy, it's, it's really um, because they've been inundated with, um, with uh, uh, requests for, for traceability. And I believe that. I think that's a, it's the way of the, the future. And I think it's going to be particularly important among the brands. Um, and then the big question for the market that I don't think anyone's really asking yet is that what happens the day after the war? Um, is El Rosa building up an inventory? Um, and then, you know, and suddenly they're taken off the OFAC listed, you know, whether it's in 2022, 23, in five years time, 10 years time, at some point, Arosa will come back to the, will, will, we hope, come back to the market as a legitimate, legitimate and responsible player, and will have all this inventory to, to sell to the market. So what, what will happen to the market? They're all, there's always at the back of our mind, um, this question of, of oversupply, or, um, or flooding the market with goods, or, um, uh, or um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a question. I, there are all sorts of <laughs> scenarios that, that, can, uh, that can play out. And then again, also the, the question of, of how, will the, how will the US market in particular and the, and the European brands relate to, to, to Russian diamonds? And um, these are all questions that I think we need to think about today, even though it's not on um, the immediate agenda. Um, but it kind of reminds me of um, around the beginning of last year, 2021, the GIA had a, back, a backlog of diamonds um, uh, uh, in, the, in their system, and it was creating a shortage of a shortage in the in the in the market. And um, and we knew that at some point those goods would be released to the, would be released to the market. And so although there was talk of a shortage, there was also that concern of excess supply at some point coming. And we saw actually in the third quarter, I think it was, that there was a lot of diamonds that came to the market in, um, um, as, as, that, uh, as the GIA and other labs as well, were able to, to release those goods and, and relieve their, their, um, their backlog. And so it's not a same situ scenario, but this is more, uh, it's a similar question, but more in the long term. At the moment, we are worried about shortages of Russian goods, uh, or shortages as a result of the Russian goods. But at some point in the future, whenever that may be, um, we also got to think about those goods coming to the market in whatever form they, do, they are. I think, in the I think in the short to medium term, the goods will come to the market in some way. And, and as I said before, the, the, the industry will bifurcate, will segment into Russian and non-Russian supply, and that will make traceability all the more important and source verification all the more important. So that's my little shtick over there. Um, it's a complicated market. I thank you for, for listening. Um, we'll be discussing these um, issues again in Vegas. Um, Martin, uh, Martin will be on Rapport, we'll be holding, uh, we'll be holding the Rapport breakfast. Mark will give his state of the industry address. He also wrote a great article in the in the Rapport magazine, which um, you should be getting soon and, and will be online soon as well. So look out for. And if you're going to be in Vegas, um, I encourage you to attend the breakfast you can, and also to attend the social responsibility conference that we will be having on, on the Sunday, um, June 12th. And you can register at rapport.com slash jck22. So I'll be happy to, I'm sorry I went a bit over time again, but I'll be happy to take some questions um, in the, in the Q&A. If you can put, uh, if you have any questions, um, I'll take them now. Thanks for listening, everyone. And, um, and if you want to get hold of me, my details are on the screen at the moment. Okay, so the first question is, what is my take on the very lengthy sales agreement negotiations in Botswana? 
Um, what do you expect from them when they eventually conclude? As you know, they are sch currently scheduled to end this month. Well, um, they are, um, they have been going on for some time. They've been delayed. They were delayed initially because of COVID and it was supposed to be, and this is the supply agreement that De Beers negotiates every 10 years with the Botswana government. De Beers um, is partly owned by the Botswana government. Government has 15% of uh, stake in De Beers. Um, but uh, as part of its license to, um, to produce, to operate its mines and to sell its goods and um, the, 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 there's all sorts of nuance in, in the relationship between De Beers and the Botswana government. I think the bottom line for the Botswana government um, is that they want more goods manufactured in Botswana and they will, and that they also want um, a a better, a, a bit, a more more incentive um, to sell to sell through their own mechanisms, but, um, mainly, uh, namely the Okavango Diamond Company. I'm not privy to what's on the table at the beers. It's it's really speculation at this point, but that's generally the <clears throat> that's generally uh, how I understand the the discussion. That it's really a question of what can we do or what can they do to, um, to further beneficiation in Botswana and to in, ensure that the, um, that, the industry, that the industry there um, gains uh, some independence and uh, diversification from the De Beers um, structure. I, um, I don't feel like it's as a burning question as it, as it was in the past. Um, I think uh, I'm pretty confident that De Beers has a, has a good relationship with, with um, Botswana and they, they need each other, I think. And I don't think that there's this um, sort of uh, mysterious uh, backhanding. I hope not. Uh, I, I don't think there is, um, but, uh, but I, I, you get the sense that it's a, that it's, um, a cooperative um, relationship. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. I will say this, that I think that... Um, Again, going back to the Russia issue, I, I think um, there's, there's, I would like the Botswana government to do more to brand its diamonds. I think they have an opportunity to really tell a great story. And I don't think um, outside of the De Beers um, framework, I don't think the Botswana story has been told um, very well. And I think there's an opportunity there, particularly in today's environment for places, for Botswana in particular, to brand its diamonds, to do, to tell it, to tell a good story, and and perhaps sell at a premium as they as they would want to. Um, so that's that's what I would say about um that. I, I'm I'm not particularly concerned about the sales agreement, but I think Botswana has an opportunity to really take advantage of the current market um, market environment. Okay. Um, do you already have any indications as to how the Russian diamond issue is affecting the market shares of the major diamond trading hubs, um, such as Antwerp, Dubai, Mumbai, for rough or polished? Uh, you know, the more we, we write about and talk about one centre versus the other, in terms of the trading centers, it becomes kind of sensitive. I am, um, in fact, um, one of our journalists is, is, is working on a piece um, about um, uh, sort of Antwerp, the, the relationship between, between Antwerp and, and Dubai in particular and the sort of struggle for market share. We know that um, Antwerp was the biggest um, customer of El Rosa, has been historically. Um, and so I don't know how that's going to play out. Um, Antwerp, I think, has, um, uh, has the EU sensitivities to contend with. Um, into uh, whereas a place like Dubai um, doesn't necessarily, and this is in relation to the to the Russia conflict, and so I, it's a tough, tough question. What I um, what I, what I would like to say about it is that I would like to see more transparency from it, from all parties, um, in particular in particular from Dubai and Antwerp. Um, I think we can get some more data from both from both centers. Antwerp stopped uh, publishing 
um, data on a monthly basis in terms of their imports and exports of rough and polished diamonds that they're, they're publishing now on a half yearly basis, which is still more than Dubai. Um, Dubai publishes only on a on a on an annual basis. I mean, we have to ask them for it, and so it would be it would be very it would give much greater insight to the market if we had that information. Um, and that's uh, that's all I can say. So, so I, I, I'm not sure how it's going to going to play out. It seems on the surface that Dubai this is another opportunity for Dubai to capitalize and 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 take some market share from um, from Antwerp simply because they'll probably be willing to sell Russian goods or import Russian goods, or, be, or let's say it'll be easier to import Russian goods to to Dubai for anyone um, willing to buy them. Um, Okay, would like to see these graphics for over one carat. Um, are they available? We do publish um, a three carat RAPI um, index. Um, uh, the the higher the the higher the, the larger the size, the less goods we have available to to make that inventory comparison. But um, but there is sufficient at least for, on the three carat. Is, um, it's something I would need to look at. We do publish the RAPI, the three carat RAPI on a on a consistent basis and certainly um, in our monthly research report which um, will be published for subscribers um, next week end of next week and I'll be touching in written format a lot of what I spoke about today um, we do give uh, we do give inventory data on uh, on 30 points as half carat one carat and three carats as well where would sit Mountain Province in these various categories, inventory, rough diamonds? Um, Mountain Province, I think, has had about 3% of the, of the market um, in terms of global rough production. Um, they have the one mine, which is the Gacha Quay mine. They own 49% of that. It's a high volume mine. It's a, it produces about six or seven million carats a year. Um, De Beers owns 51% of it. And Mountain Province, the 49%. And so um, they have about three percent of the market. I think they sell, and they sell via auctions or tenders. Um, I think in Antwerp. Um, again, uh, they, they they being a Canadian company, and there are a few Canadian companies out there. Um, ACDC, it's Arctic Canadian Diamond Company, which used to be the Dominion, and they own their Kaiti mine. These are come. They have the Canada mark, and again. Canada is another country which actually has the has the um, has the framework with Canada mark, for example, to sell Canada sourced diamonds, and that's becoming very powerful um, in today's environment. Okay, I'll take a few more questions, and uh, if you um, need to go, I'm not keeping you. <laughs> I hope I'm not keeping you. Um, we will be publishing this video on um, on on our website and, and subsequently YouTube. But um, I'll take two or three um, uh, three more questions. In the okay, so it's an uh, it's an important question. This I think um, in the in the minus five and minus three goods, the Russian supply is very high percentage. Um, up to 70% according to our, um, our uh, author over here. Um, will this mean that the only volume alternative is lab grown below um, 1.3 millimeters? So um, I, I can't comment on the sizes, but the, the question whether, because it is essentially on a more general level, because El Rosa accounts for such a high percentage of small melee, um, will, uh, will brands or, or retailers or jewelers in general, jewelry um, manufacturers turn to lab grown to fill that supply gap. And um, it's a question I've been asking people. Um, in theory, you would think so, but um, whoever I've asked and spoken to, and maybe I'm speaking to the wrong people, um, they seem to dismiss that claim. Um, and uh, the, and 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 the the reasoning that I'm hearing, and I, and I, I do believe it myself, is that um, it's that the, the markets that the lab grown and natural markets are segmenting, 
even though there is overlap and even though there is, uh, you know, that lab grown is, is being sold in some way um, as a bridal product, whatever it is, but there are clearly two different products and that's the mindset that the natural diamond industry, um, I think, has, um, at least on the higher end. I think that, that is um, certainly the case. And it's very difficult to sell a, um, a mixed product. Uh, so, so if it's a piece of fashion jewelry with the, the big, or, or, or you know, it's a, it's a, it's a ring with the big sensor stone, and usually it would have melee as a pavé, uh, a pavé setting around it, or, or, or whatever it is. If you have that natural stone, and then the rest is filled with lab-grown um, melee, it's very difficult, to, I think, to sell, for a retailer to sell that mixed product. The other question that I've been thinking about in terms of the lab grown market is the labor, is the, the cost of, man, of manufacturing lab grown. And um, the argument for India, um, for the Indian manufacturing sector and the growth that's driven it has been the labor cost that the, that the for natural diamonds below half carat, um, it's economic. To, uh, it's economic to to manufacture in India because the labor cost is not as high. The, the proportion of the labor cost is not as high as in the other centers, and that that um, it seems to me that that um, that changes for lab grown. And I, I need to think about it more, but um, I think as the labor cost um, or as the price of lab grown comes down. And the labor cost um, remains constant, or you know, and it's the same or the same labor cost as, as a natural diamond. That that'll start to come to play, I think, and, and it might not always be so economical for manufacturers to to keep their workers busy, for example, with lab grown or to. Um, but I, it seems to me that um, the bigger question at the moment is. Um, would retailers be able, be willing to sell a mixed product? And I don't think that they will at the moment. Okay. Um, do you think the consumer perception of Russian goods will persist even if the war ends and assuming the sanctions are lifted? I think it, it really depends on the political situation in, in, in Russia. And, um, you, you know, the, the, what, one of the, one of the, you know, the, the sad parts about, about it for the industry is that Russia, sorry, is that El Rosa has been such a great citizen, actually, in the diamond industry. Um, and, the, you know, we, we, a lot of us know the personalities on a personal level, and there's a lot, they're great friendships with, within the diamond industry with the El Rosa team. Um, they've sat on very important boards. Um, you know, it became headlines that um, El Rosa quits the RJC board um, and this board and the WDC, the World Diamond Council and the, you know, the, the system of warranties, for example, um, of the World Diamond Council was, was a, a, the El Rosa representative played a very important role in putting that together. And so I think um, within the trade, I think that El Rosa will be, it, it will be a quicker um, reintegration, but I think it might take the American consumer a bit of time um, before um, before it uh, changes its perception about Russia in general. Um, and I think it will take the retailer, the U.S. retailer, um, uh, the the U.S. retailer will have have greater considerations because it will have to be wary of dates that the 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 Russian goods supplied between, say, March 11, which is the, the date that we're looking at, or, or that I'm thinking about, when the sanctions, the real, the, the first sanctions came into place of, um, of the U, of banning Russian origin goods, until that date when the war ends and the sanctions are lifted, um, that'll still be a problematic period, I think. And so the U.S. retail, in terms of its buying and uh, and and sourcing of of polished diamonds, will still be need to be very careful, and the industry will still need to make very careful disclosures. Okay, is yeah, is trace of origin possible or financially viable in melee sizes? 
Um, that's the biggest, that's the, the big challenge at the moment for, for the industry is in the melee. If you can't trace goods, I think there are one or two of those traceability service providers that are working on it at least or claiming that they can provide that um, traceability, but it's an excellent question. I don't have an answer for you at the moment. Um, it's always been a difficult um, thing to, to um, it's always been a difficult uh, um, what's the word, claim to make or, or, or a promise to make. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, we'll, we'll take a few more. How much scope do you see that there is for the big miners, excluding the Russians, to increase production in an attempt to fill any potential supply drop caused by the Ukraine crisis? I don't see much scope, to be honest. I think um, we've seen a production peak a global production peak in, um, I forget when it uh, was, I forget, I think it was 2020, sorry, 2018 or so. Um, and we've seen a gradual decline. COVID reset the bar in terms of, um, of global production um, lower. And, um, and our projections were that there would be, a, it would be, fairly stable, um, at least in the near term. So I don't see any major mines coming, coming on soon that will necessarily um, fill the gap. Um, there are one or two projects that are in, um, that, that are, that, that, um, that, that do, that are focusing on certain segments of the market where there is an expected shortage, such as those smaller goods or the lower quality goods. Remember, there was also the Argyle mine that closed down um, a year ago, end of 2020, and that took a lot of carrots off the market, um, particularly on the lower quality goods. And so, all this, um, to, uh, you know, the, the, the question to answer the question, I don't see um, much scope for a um, for a De Beers to to raise its um, to raise its uh, production uh, or, or Petro Diamonds, whoever it is. And I think that uh, they would rather want to see anyway um, some supply constraints um, feeding into their, into, into their pricing, but um, we'll see how that play, plays out. Okay, um, do you have anecdotal evidence that American retail consumers are demanding high-end jewelry with non-Russian diamonds? Um, uh, no, I, I haven't spoken to consumers about it. Um, I haven't seen much um, in, in terms of uh, in terms of um, surveys done asking that specific question. But we do know that um, that the the um, social responsibility aspect of of um, a consideration of consumers is rising. And uh, the ethical sourcing is becoming is is without a doubt becoming a um, has become a uh, an important aspect of the of the consumer experience. Um, De Beers put out their Insight Report report last year, which looked at um, towards the end of last year, which which uh, which looked at um, sustainability and uh, and the question of ESG and uh, and um, social responsibility and whether consumers are willing to pay more for, for ethically sourced diamonds. And this fits into that narrative. It's not necessarily, it's actually not necessarily a question of the Russian, non-Russian. It's a question of ethical, um, non-ethical and or, or, or responsible sourcing rather, um, wherever you stand on the political, spe <laughs> political spectrum. But uh, in terms of responsible sourcing, that's the question. And that's been going on for a long time. And now the Russian story, because it holds such a large proportion of supply, of global supply, it becomes even more important. And it's re and so it catapulted the question onto the, uh, into, the, into the forefront of the industry's um, minds. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, I, I think we do have evidence. We, you know, we haven't had the question on the Russian, particularly on Russia, but we've had the question on responsible sourcing in general. And to the American consumer, that's part of this, this is very much a responsible sourcing, responsible buying, um, ethical consumerism question. 
Okay, I've had a few questions about um, receiving the presentation by mail. Um, I'm not able to, I'm not going to be sending the PDF out, but we will publish the um, video on diamonds.net in the coming week. Okay, we've got two more questions, so bear with me. Um, does the current Orosa issue provide a positive sentiment for the lab grown market? What is your take on the LGD? Um, we have, uh, we had a similar question earlier, obviously I, I addressed it. Um, I don't know if it changed uh, sentiment about, uh, I don't, I don't think it changes sentiment. I think, um, I think the lab grown companies will continue to do their thing. And they, they, you know, in the past they have, um, they have, uh, they have used sort of negative um, advertising to push their product. This may be an opportunity to do that again, saying we only have, you know, it's all, it's all American grown diamonds. Um, but there are also growers in in Russia. Russia has actually had um, a lot of technological success. A lot of the bigger stones, early bigger stones. Um, coming out of Russia, those record-breaking lab-grown diamonds um, were coming out of Russia. So it's I, I don't I don't think it'll be it'll change sentiment in the in in, in the lab-grown discussion. Um, okay, and that's and that's basically it. The the next question also touches on the um, on the lab-grown um, question. So. If you have any further questions, I'm happy to hear from you on by email. Um, I'm in terms of social media, I'm most uh, I'm most aware on LinkedIn, so feel free to um, and I'm most active on LinkedIn, so feel free to, to follow me there or connect with me there. I'll be happy to to keep the discussion going, and uh, I hope you're all doing well. It's a fun, interesting market from my perspective, um, and one that's uh, that's uh, difficult to navigate. So. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, thank you for joining me and um, I hope to see you all soon. Take care, everyone.